Welcome to the Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into important topics like creativity, personal development, marketing, health, spirituality, and so much more. Thanks for spending some time with me today. Now sit back and enjoy the show. Well, I think we're almost there. So good morning again to all my friends out there in Facebook land. Uh, We had some technical difficulties uh, trying to do the live stream the way I was originally planning. So did a little tap dancing and figured out an alternative. So here we are. So thank you, BeLive.tv, for being a highly functional interface that will work today. Not sure what happened with the Skype update, but it seemed uh, to break Ecamm Live for some reason. So we are going with an alternative. Uh, but excited to bring my friend Mark Ward back on the show to share with all of you today. We're going to be talking about his brand new book, and that's called Authorized, The Use and Misuse of the King James Bible. Mark, welcome back to the show, man. After all our technical difficulties, it feels especially good to finally be back on the show. Well, uh, first things first, man, I always want uh, people to know a little bit about the author. And I know you've been on twice, but I know I have new listeners, new viewers since the last time we talked. So uh, give us a little context for your work at Faith Life and tell us a little bit about your areas of academic expertise, because I think those will relate well into why you actually pursued a book about the King James Version. Right. I work at Faith Life, makers of Logos Bible software, and my job for the last two and a half years has largely been writing, writing biblical exegesis, um, tips on Bible study for mostly for pastors and other Bible nerds, but certainly for other people in the church as well. And as part of that, I often uh, tell people, show people how you can use Logos Bible software in your work. I'm just transitioning now to work for our in-house publishing arm, which is kind of an up-and-coming evangelical publisher, Lexham Press. And they're the ones who put out my new book, Authorized, The Use and Misuse of the King James Bible. They did a great job. I really enjoyed working with them, and now I'm working for them. Very nice. Well, uh, I wouldn't want to answer your other question. I wouldn't want to call it expertise. I'd want someone else to say that and not me, because the Bible says, let another man praise you and not your own lips. But I have studied New Testament exegesis uh, up at the doctoral level, and um, I'm particularly interested in uh, Bible translation and, and into English, and I often have worked on the, um, the usefulness of uh, complementary Bible translations. Well, and uh, with moving, transitioning into working with Lex and Press, what were what will your official title be now? Because I, I think historically I've known you as a as a Logos, Logos Pro, what, what will your new title be? I haven't gotten around to asking yet. I, <laughs> I started this week, and for various reasons in God's providence, uh, including a surgery in my family, I don't yet know. I just haven't spent enough time in the office to find out. So I'll, I'll get back to you on that to know what my title will be. Well, you know, whenever they give you new business cards, you'll be like, oh, that's what I call myself. Okay, okay, yeah, good. good to know. That's how I'll know. Well, I think another interesting place for us to begin um, would be to learn a little bit about your your personal journey with the King James Version. Um, you know, is this the Bible you grew up with? Was this used in your church? Like, what 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 was your initial exposure to this Bible? I did grow up with the King James Version, and during a, the most formative portion of my childhood, which would have been my high school years, I went to a very good Christian school. Um, the teachers are still my friends, and uh, one of them read my book twice, and his wife read it as well. Uh, and yet, that church the, uh, the the school was a part of was King James only. And I had had a little exposure as a kid, you know, it w- went over my head to King James onlyism. But in that church, uh, they weren't jerks about it. They were gracious, and they were, but they were insistent. This is the only good English Bible translation. And I picked up that idea and, you know, didn't distrust my pastor. But my personal journey continued into a Christian college where one of my professors said, you know, pick up the New International Version if you want to read big chunks of the Bible at a time because it reads more smoothly. And I was in a stage when I was willing to learn. So that's what I did. And I remember my conscience telling me, no, 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 this can't be right. This can't be right. 
Um, but I've been getting good Bible teaching in my new church in my college town and good Bible teaching in school. And I pushed past what I knew then to, to be a false positive, you know, a conscience that's shouting when it shouldn't. And I started very quickly to see the benefits of using multiple good English Bible translations. That's, that's my journey. I, and I basically want to help other people take the same journey. Well, and I, you know, through the years, I, I've, I grew up in very conservative, I grew up Lutheran and uh, attended Bethlehem Baptist uh, in my early adult years. So I, I, I was raised in very conservative circles. And uh, just with the work I've done in publishing, I know a lot of people who lean towards, you know, kind of that KJV only crowd. And, you know, we often hear statements like uh, the King James Version is the most accurate Bible translation. Um, would love to have you have you talk to us just a bit about, you know, whether or not something like that's actually a fair statement and maybe take that to transition us into a little bit of insight into, you know, what does it look like to uh, put together a new Bible translation? You know, what, what's how is that constructed and vetted? Because there's there's a whole process to that. And we've got lots of uh, English Bible translations available now. So help us well, dig into that. You just asked 10 questions. I know. I know. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I okay. love to ask really complicated questions. So, um, so but, look, can I get back to the one that I really want to talk about? Because yes. it's a fantastic question. It's, it's about whether you can say that the King James is the most accurate Bible translation. And there, I have two big responses to that. The first one is the focus of the book. And that is that, sure, yes, the King James was an accurate translation. And I say was not because it's become inaccurate somehow. I mean, the words on the page haven't changed. They've been revised in minor ways. In fact, the spelling has been improved according to our standards. The final revision of the King James, the one that almost everybody uses, came out in 1769. But I say it was a good translation because the English into which it was translated is no longer spoken or written anywhere in the world. Yes, we read Elizabethan English, you know, we study Shakespeare in school, but there's no native speaker of that English. So uh, C.S. Lewis said, and I have this quote in the book, it's no use saying, I'm going to buy my kid a suit once and for all. Well, kids keep growing and languages keep changing. That's the big point of the book. So I, I'm not blaming anybody for our current difficulty in reading this good translation. I'm saying English has changed. The second thing I'd say about that is I think that a lot of Christians out there, um, and I don't know a nicer way to say this, they really need to take a humble pill when it comes to complicated claims. Okay. There are thousands, excuse me. Bless you. Sorry, TV land. Um, <laughs> and look at those artifacts. Wow. That was a powerful sneeze. Um, there are tens of thousands of exegetical and interpretational and translation choices that go into any Bible translation. And to say this one is the most accurate is to implicitly claim that you have evaluated many, 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 let's say, of those choices. And you've compared it to um, the choices of another translation. And I say, how many people have actually done that? No, aren't, ha hardly anyone has done that. And people who say the King James is the most accurate or the NASB is the most accurate or the NIV is the most accurate. Most typically, they're basing that on authority. And that's fine. We all do that all the time. But that's a different discussion. And, and my book is trying to uh, get away from topics in which we have to rely on the authority of others and dig into something that every English speaking reader should be able to handle on their own. And that is, is this our English? And my answer, and I help people see this, is no, it's not. Well, and um, I'll just throw out kind of the, the second part of my super complicated, long 10 question question. Um, you know, for the for the person who they've got an English Bible, but they just don't have a context and a background where they've ever even thought through how or why you would put together or construct vet in English translation. Any any insight you can share about what that what that might look like? Yeah, uh, since the King James, and actually going very early into English Bible translation, um, but after Tyndall, who was the first uh, translator of the Bible into modern English, uh, going back then all the way in that history, translations have typically been done by committee. 
the King James had 40 something translators divided up into companies and they were given a charter um, by the government to revise the Bishop's Bible of 1568. And that too is typical. Um, a brand new translation is, you know, uh, I would say it's uncommon. Among the major evangelical English Bible translations, they pretty much all have a lineage. Even the NIV, which was started as a fresh translation, now it's in its second major edition, the 2011 versus the original 1984. Um, and even the 1984, I read up on the history of it, and one of the translators said they had to work very hard to try to clear the King James out of their minds and, and go at this fresh. And one thing I observe in the book is all the people who are afraid about how different Bible translations are, you know, what if they conflict, then you know, who's right, and how can I know what the truth is? Um, I observed that I don't know that the NIV translators were all that successful in getting out of the King James tradition. Um, the, I, I think the King James casts a good long shadow and all of the translations we have, all the good ones, all the major evangelical ones that you can buy in your bookstore, um, they are following basically in its tradition, done by committees, um, worked on intensively with editors and translators, uh, uh, a whole team puts them together. Uh, next, I'd love to have you share a bit about, you know, what what are some of the important things that the King James Version still offers us today? I mean, is it, uh, some people would say we need to throw it away and we don't need it. And it, yet it seems like it, there are many reasons it's, it's something that shouldn't be um, completely lost uh, from uh, our use in churches today. It, it feels like we would be doing ourselves a disservice if it just completely went away and was no longer used or read. Yes, I agree. The first chapter of my book talks about the things that we will lose and are losing as the King James drops from its you know, 100% market penetration uh, from being essentially the only English Bible. It never was the only, but uh, effectively it was for a long, long, long time. Uh, as it moves now to, I think the stats I read when preparing the book uh, put out by the Pew Research Center and Mark Knoll were that of all the Bibles pulled down from a shelf in America today to be read, 55% of them were King James Version Bibles. And that was, that was actually a catalyst for me to write this book. I thought, wow, its readership is higher than I realized. The sales are actually not quite as good now, the readership still is. People, I assume, then are pulling down what they happen to have in some cases. Maybe they're not King James only. This is just what they have. And I'm in, uh, in the book urging people to, um, to see the, the ways that changes in English have affected their reading of the King James. I, I think there are, cultural, um, there are cultural values that come when we share a common text. So Shakespearean allusions and phrases are in our English. And so are many, many King James phrases like by the skin of his teeth, am I my brother's keeper? Um, a culture has to have those things and will. And yes, it's a shame when um, a standard text like Shakespeare's plays or the King James, you know, fades from public use. We lose some of those. Um, but the book focuses then on, by the end on other things that will gain. So it's not merely losing. I think there are some things we'll gain. Well, you know, as, as somebody who cut my teeth uh, in Christian retail, one of the most horrifying questions could be, hey, I'm looking for a new Bible. And, and as you walk them over to the section, you see their eyes kind of glaze over. And this was back in the late 90s. And it's there's even more available now. I mean, we thought we had a lot of Bibles and variations back then. Well, hey, there's even more today. Um, you know, so... For somebody who, who's listening right now who wants some guidance on, well, what would be a good Bible translation for me to use? I uh, would love to hear a little bit about that. And then, um, you know, in terms of Bible study, is it good for somebody to be reading from just one particular translation? Or would there be a benefit for us to seek out many translations as we're digging into God's Word? Well, one important answer to both of your questions is this. We should not be looking for the best English Bible translation. 
the Bible itself never promises that we will have one best or one truly reliable translation, whether that be the King James or the NASB or whatever. Um, so it's totally appropriate for us to look to a verse like 1 Corinthians 3, I think it's verse 22, where Paul says, okay, you've got Paul and Apollos and Cephas, and we've got people in the ch Corinthian church saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. And what Paul says to these people is, okay, look at these teachers, Paul, Apollos, and, and Peter. Um, all are yours, he says. What does that mean? Well, Ephesians 4, teachers are God's gift to the church. Who are Bible translators of evangelical Bible translations in English? They are all Bible teachers given to the church. Are they perfect? No, any more than your pastor who's given to your church is perfect. Um, but are they God's gift to the church? Yes, they are, and all are yours. So you have every reason to use all of the riches available to you. I'd also say that, yes, it can be confusing. You go to the bookstore, which one should I get? But hopefully, people who are now cutting their teeth in Christian retail will do a little bit of study, and it's not hard to catch the basic character of all the major evangelical English Bible translations. The NIV is um, smoother reading, but a little more interpretive. Um, a lot of the people who uh, say the King James is accurate, they, they talk as if a smoother reading translation is sort of pandering to people. I say, I want all the pandering I can get if it's going to help me understand the Bible. <laughs> and it does. You know, I work full time in pretty much academic biblical studies. And where do I turn when I first start to study a passage? I turn right to my English Bible translations and I compare them. And I've done that now since 1999 when I bought a big, fat, comparative study Bible with four different Bible translations mapped in it. And that thing is full of my notes because as an 18 year old at the time who spent 50 bucks, which, and I checked this, it's like $78 in today's money. Okay. So I don't know where I came up with this money. Um, that thing was so valuable to me. And, and when I hear people, you know, arguing about, well, this translation is the best one. This one's the best one. I just say, why bother? There's no reason. You're just shutting yourself off from riches about which God said, all are yours. Do some basic study. Read some of my blog posts at the Logos blog where I've talked about this. Take my little course. I have a course from Logos Mobile Ed on choosing the right Bible translation for the task. You want a more interpretive translation when you're reading big chunks. You want a more literal or formal translation when you're doing really detailed study. But there's no reason to anoint one and say, this is you know, the one translation to rule them all and in the dark to spine them. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Um, you know, Mark, as you think of a reader getting to the end of the book, you know, is, is there one, if you could say every reader takes away this one core message or this one core, core truth after reading Authorized, what do, you, what do you most hope that is? It's one that I haven't yet mentioned in this conversation. It's the concept of false friends. So growing up with the King James, I was a rather nerdy kid. In the book, I say that um, because I was sort of a runt in my class, I was um, born in October and therefore went to kindergarten early and, um, and then ended up skipping a grade. I couldn't use traditional means to, to uh, social prominence and the impressing of girls. So, um, you know, athletics. So um, I thought that being smart would do it. My wife has informed me that I still failed to impress girls. But so <laughs> I, I loved being the kid who knew all the vocab words. And I took pride, and I mean that in the sinful sense, in my ability to read the King James Version. Um, and if someone said to me, well, it's too hard, I would have scoffed at them. And if I were in a kinder mood, I would have said, are, aren't you just being lazy? Don't you know how to use a dictionary? But what I discovered over the years when I got into reading multiple Bible translations is that um, there are many words we know we don't know, like besom, chambering, and emerald. We all intuitively sense. We've never used those words in regular conversation. We have to go use the dictionary to look them up. But, and those, so those are dead words. But then there is, are these words that I call false friends. This is a term drawn from linguistics in general. Uh, and those are words that we don't know we don't know. We read right past them because we still use those words, but we use them differently than they did in 1611. Frequently, they use them, they could use them in the same way we do, 
but they had an additional sense that just isn't available in contemporary English. Hmm. That's helpful. That's helpful. Uh, one, one question I always like to throw out when I talk to you, Mark, cause I'm always intrigued by the many things you're doing. Um, last time we talked, I'd asked about any new projects and this was the book that you were working on, uh, at that time. So I'm going to ask you the same question. Any, uh, any new projects, books on the horizons, the concepts you're thinking about that you are at liberty to share. I understand now that you are in some unnamed position at Lexham Press, maybe what you can share is different now. Uh, but curious if you have anything new in the works we should have, a, have our eyes on the horizon for. Boy, this is tough because there is one idea I have, and part of me is saying I should keep it a secret. Um, <laughs> but, but actually, for, for your viewers, maybe you could give me some wisdom out there, viewers. Tell me if you think this would be helpful. Um, my I am, and my, my wife and I have talked about this a lot, I'm concerned about uh, claims made by Christian moms in particular, but not only moms, on Facebook about the amazing spiritual powers of essential oils. I was in the mountains of North Carolina, and we were at a little gem mine where you kids get a the kids get a bucket of sand and rock, and they have to wash it out and see what kind of gems they get. And the kids loved it. And I looked up on this uh, door there. They had a huge sign, and it's all painted. And it said at the top, "Healing Stones." And there's like calcite and carnelian and granite and all these things. And as I read the supposed healing properties of all these stones, I had an immediate flashback to what I've seen Christian moms that I respect and love, what they've said about essential oils. Um, you know, I'm going to rub valor oil on my wrist to give me courage. Um, and I believe that we are psychosomatic unities. The Bible says you know, our bodies and spirits are inseparably tied at, at this time. You know, they'll be temporarily untied during uh, the intermediate state, but the permanent state of mankind is to be body and soul like Jesus is. Um, so, yes, physical things that I ingest or touch can affect my body. Um, but where does the, where's the Bible's energy on anxiety? I would say Jesus places that on on the spirit by saying, be anxious for nothing. Um, no, that's Paul. Um, he says, uh, don't worry in the Sermon on the Mount um, because not you can take this oil or you know touch this stone, but don't worry because your heavenly father knows what you need. That's a spiritual answer to a spiritual problem. So you out there tell me if this would be worth writing on. Frankly, we have enough people we love and respect that are using essential oils and we don't want our house to be burned down. So um, we, we may not go for this project. I may instead write another book following authorized that shows positively constructively how, um, how can someone who hasn't read Greek and Hebrew, hasn't studied those languages, how can they use multiple English Bible translations profitably in their study? Hmm. Well, I think um, at the very least, the the whole uh, spiritual power properties of essential oils, that's at least one or two good blog posts, maybe a booklet. Um, I, th I think you could do something inter interesting with that in the same way that you did with the, the Should I Smoke Pot, Should Christian Smoke Pot book, where you taught people, even though they're reading this book about, you know, the kind of the debate, the debate about should Christians smoke pot, how should this be used in culture, you taught them how to think biblically through a, through that problem. And I think you could maybe do something similar here. It, it's an interesting, in, interesting problem for, you know, if, if Mark moves forward with writing said blog post or book or booklet, and you're going to come burn his house down. My only caution is if you're covered in oil, you're going to be very flammable. So be, be very careful. Thank you for that. That's a good point. <laughs> Oh, uh, that, that was a weird way to, to, to begin to wrap up the interview, but thank you. Thank you for sharing some of the things that are uh, in mind for potential future books. It's always fun to hear about that. Uh, Mark, if people want to connect with you, where are some of the places that they can find you online and where should they go specifically if they want to learn about the new book? If you want to learn about this new book and you do, if you've made it this far in the interview, it's authorizedbook.com. I will say um, that nearly every reviewer who's reviewed the book has said something about the humor in the book. 
And I can, so 92% guarantee that you'll laugh at least twice if you read the book. And so if that doesn't sell it, I don't know what will. But uh, those who are interested in Bible study and curious about, you know, what are some of the ways that English has changed in the King James can go to authorizedbook.com. You can connect with me at byfaithweunderstand.com, which is my personal blog. And you can also read uh, now over 200 articles that I've written for Logos at blog.logos.com. And you can't miss me there. Well, as I do with every episode, I will include links in the show notes for all the places you can connect with Mark and places where you can buy Authorized and some of his other books. Uh, It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Mark Ward. Once again, our book today was Authorized, The Use and Misuse of the King James Bible. Once again, to connect with Mark and find out more about this new book, be sure to visit his website at authorizedbook.com. Mark, I want to say thanks so much for uh, being willing to uh, work with me through like 25 minutes of technical difficulties to make this interview happen. Uh, It's always a great pleasure to speak with you, man. Appreciate what you do. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. That's all for this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show. If you have a question or comment, be sure to give me a shout out on social media or send an email to show at seantabbitt.com. The intro and outro music is from the song titled Jesus Loves You. Written and performed by my good friend Casper McLeod. It is from his album Faithfulness, which is available at theupperroomfellowship.org. Until next time, this is your host Sean Tabbitt, signing off.